Good morning, everyone, and welcome to More to Explore. Hello, Flower Bear, for, thank you for saying that you love these Monday morning shows and you really enjoy starting your week with them. So do I. I'm so excited to bring this show to you. And man, do we have a packed show today because summer is just around the corner and I'm sure many of us can't wait for it soon to be here soon enough. We have orcas, we have walrus, we have beluga whales, we have a new bat cam, and of course, bear cam that we'll preview today. Also coming up today, we have our founder, Charlie Annenberg, who will tell us about his latest adventure for ocean conservation. And we have three new chicks today to meet on this week's Egg Watch. Uh, but before we get to that, I, I do want to know from our audience, which cams are you most excited for and why is it bear cam? <laughs> Uh, but seriously, I, I'm curious to uh, share in the chat, like how long have you been watching Explore? And I'm really curious, do we have any newbies in the audience? Is your first summer with Explore? You're in for a real treat. As usual, my name is Brian, and today I'm lucky to be joined once again by a resident naturalist, Mike Fitz. Mike, how excited are you for summer to be coming? Excited and overwhelmed. There's so much <laughs> to take in. Uh, not only on explore.org, but just in my local neighborhood. I, I took a walk in the woods last week and I, I covered like a half mile in two hours because there was wow. just so much to look at. So there's so much, so much going on. And uh, welcome to everybody who's watching today. Uh, for those of you who are new to explore, new to explore.org, uh, welcome to the community. And of course, welcome back to all our live, our longtime viewers. We're the world's largest live nature camp network with more than 180 live all over the world. We'll be introducing a new live, live cam that'll be coming your way soon. But to start our summer preview, we're looking at Orca Lab. Uh, Brian, this is um, located off the coast of British Columbia. Uh, and before we get to uh, more about Orca Lab, reminder to ask, uh, ask us questions if you want to. Brian and I are here live, so we want to see your comments and questions. Please drop those into the chats. But Brian, yeah, we're going to go into Orca Lab here first. Yes, yeah, the replay real quick uh, up on Hanson Island. We have Orca Lab. So if you enjoy whale watching, but don't want to travel to Vancouver Island, we get to see a lot of many cams here on the, the main cam here. We have multiple cameras running all at once. And as the orcas are coming through, they'll switch between cameras to make sure we get the best views possible. Yeah, the main camera is going to be, you know, looking above the water, looking for traveling orcas, maybe other species of animals, like uh, sometimes there can be humpback whales, depending on the time of the year moving through there. The really cool cams, I think, even though they're all cool, of course, but the I guess the most unique cameras that we have at, with our partners at Orca Lab is the rubbing beach cameras. There's an above water one and then an underwater camera. And the underwater one is currently offline. Uh, but that one should be up and running soon. And with those cameras, we get to see unique behaviors of a family of orcas surfing on the pebbly bottom of the shore. No one knows why they do this. It may have more than one reason, or they may have one more than one motivation to do it. But when I spoke to Paul Spong from Orca Lab earlier this year, he suspected it was a place where they can have fun and socialize. And there, so these are just amazing clips from our, our, uh, underwater camera at the rubbing beach from previous years. So look forward to that. I don't think you can get views of orca whales like this anywhere else in the world, but on explore.org. And then finally, there's also the sea lion beach camera uh, at Orca Lab as well. Uh, this is a rocky shoreline where sea lions come to rest on exposed bedrock. It's one of those kind of like relaxing cameras, but maybe not if you have the sound on. You should really tune into this <laughs> just for the audio, I think. Um, it's kind of, a, kind of a noisy camera, although you get to see all these relaxing sea lions. Sometimes they can be uh, quite vocal with one another. Uh, Brian, that's our, our Orca Lab preview, but um, our next camera on our summer preview tour also looks at whales. Yeah, our next cams coming up is with Polar Bears International in Churchill, Manitoba right here on the Churchill River, we get the Beluga Boat Cam. And fortunately, I, I was lucky enough to visit Polar Bears International this last winter, and I actually got to see the Beluga Boat in person here in the storage, you can see it right here. And this boat is specially rigged up with the technology to bring 
these live tours so you can see it behind the views if you see up up top you can see the above water camera and then here you can get a look at the underwater camera so this camera is on an arm that they can deploy into the water so you, as you can imagine so you go on daily whale watching tours and we get the unique view of above and below Yes, and these views are brought to us by our partners with Polar Bears International. So the above water view often includes live commentary from staff with Polar Bears International and the below water camera provides a unique and unprecedented views of curious beluga whales who approach the boat just because they want to. So they're not doing really anything to attract the whales. The whales are just kind of curious, want to know what's going on. So I don't think, again, this is another camera view where I don't think there is a parallel uh, in the rest of the world. So really unique, uh, whale watching opportunities through these, uh, cameras. And, uh, one more point on this is that the viewing season, uh, really the, the primetime viewing season for these cameras is July, but there's some great activity into the first half of August. So check that out in the mouth of Churchill river. Uh, there's going to be a schedule posted on the Beluga Boats, um, you know, explore.org page, maybe in the featured comment or something like that, where you can look to see when those tours uh, happen. So please, please join us for those. And we have one more marine mammal to preview before we head to more, more land-based uh, creatures. Yeah, our next stop is up in Brown Island in Alaska. And in this next clip, from one of our technicians heading to it, you can see just how remote this island is and how much like of a wonder it is to get these camera views from a destination like this. And in the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping to get another Tales from the Field about this camera insult to see what it takes to make this walrus cam happen. This is certainly one of the more remote cameras that we have. And as Brian said, it's on Round Island, Alaska, north side of Bristol Bay. It's part of the Walrus Island State Game Sanctuary, and our partner is for this camera is the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Sometimes as many as 15,000 Pacific walruses haul out on the island to rest during the summer. In the cam view, the main beach is a long, concave, cobble-covered beach. Walrus use this beach when the waters of, of the Bering Sea and Bristol Bay are free of ice. So maybe if there's still some sea ice out there right now, they're kind of hanging around, floating around in the ice, uh, diving off from time to time to feed on uh, crustaceans and mollusks on the bottom of the ocean. But when that sea ice melts away, they got to find a place to come to shore and hang out and rest. And that's uh, what we see on, on Round Island. Late spring through midsummer is prime viewing season for these cameras. And sometimes we've had the cameras live by now, but there have been some technical glitches this year that we're still working through. But we hope to have it online as soon as possible. You can also see some whales occasionally, seabirds, seals, and sea lions on this uh, on this camera. So that's it for our marine mammals for the time being, Brian. Our, our next cam preview, though, I am very excited for. This will be a new live cam that features a very different type of mammal. Yeah, I'm super excited for a new summer cam, and this will be our bracken bat cave viewing area in San Antonio, Texas with Bat Conservation International. And just seeing the preview photos of this cam, it looks like incredibly detailed. I think we're gonna have one inside and outside and just seeing how many bats there are. It looks like there's gonna be a ton of them. Yeah, holy echolocation, Batman. This is <laughs> gonna be really fun to watch. Uh, Look, this is located northeast of San Antonio, Texas. Um, our partner is Bat Conservation International. And these photos are brought to you uh, brought by Bat Conservation International, and we're taken by Jonathan Alonzo. So thanks to uh, them for sharing these photos with us. Uh, Mexican freetail bats occupy Bracken Cave. Uh, it's the largest known maternal colony of bats in the world. Perhaps somewhere like 15 to 20 million bats occupy the, the cave during the summertime. Pregnant bats migrate here after spending the winter in Mexico, Central, and South America. The uh, different camera views that we're going to have, we're going to have one uh, in the viewing area outside the cave entrance so we can watch the evening bat flight there. Basically just a tornado of bats spinning out of the cave entrance. And then also we're going to have a camera inside of the cave to provide views of the maternal colony and the pups that live inside the cave. 
The overall viewing season is late spring and summer when bats occupy the cave in large numbers, but peak bat numbers occur in July and August, since that is when young bats born in June begin to fly out of the cave. That'll be amazing to watch, uh, I'll, and I'll need to make time for it because the last part of our summer preview takes a brief look at the cams that really dictate my online wildlife watching experience for the next uh, several months. Yeah, that's right. Now, everybody's been waiting for, we're heading to Katmai National Park to see the bears of Brooks Falls. And Mike, I'm sure our returning viewers are excited to hear all about the you talk about bears again. But for our newer viewers, let's talk about each cam and what we're going to see this summer. Yeah, this is going to be uh, the thing that takes up the majority of my, my time during the summer. Uh, talking about bears and salmon at Brooks River and Katmai National Park. So I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing that experience with everybody once again. Uh, this, uh, these cameras are brought to you by uh, our partnerships with Katmai National Park and the Katmai Conservancy, where you, you get to see really the, the best views of bears fishing for salmon really anywhere in the world. We'll start uh, our tour of the river. We're just looking at the uh, lower half of Brooks River, basically from the falls downstream. But we'll start at the, the end of the river at the mouth near Naknek Lake. We'll start with our underwater camera. In this camera's uh, view, we get to see sockeye salmon and uh, occasionally bears swimming by. And this is one of my favorite cameras at Brooks River because I don't often stick my face in the water when I'm at Brooks River to look at the fish. <laughs> when the bears are around, it's really generally not a good idea to do that. So the underwater camera provides us with really these amazing views of salmon and bears swimming by. This is attached to the bridge that goes over the mouth of Brooks River. We also have two other cameras at the river mouth as well, also attached to the bridge there. The lower river camera mostly gives us a view looking sort of downstream from the bridge um, to the mouth uh, at Naknek Lake. So we'll get to see adult bears there occasionally, maybe like Otis, um, but also we'll get to see a lot of family groups in this vicinity. Some younger bears, independent juvenile bears will be in this area too. So watch for those younger bears having their first adventures on their own. Sort of a similar dynamic on the river watch as well. This, look, this one, however, looks mostly uh, upstream from the bridge itself. So we get a really great perspective on the lower river area by looking at those two above water cameras, seeing bears playing and fishing. It becomes uh, especially busy with bears in late summer and fall, but we'll also see bears there during the beginning of the salmon run, which is coming up um, in just a couple of weeks. Now, getting closer to the falls, it's still up. Looks like we may have lost you there for a second, Mike. Yeah, sorry about that. It seems like my internet always likes to drop right at this time of <laughs> the day. But anyway, it is what it is. But let's, uh, yeah, we'll go up to the, the Riffles camera, about 100 yards downstream of Brooks Falls itself. Um, and if you're not from the United States, you know, maybe looking at about 95 meters or so downstream of the falls. But well, family groups there. Um, Independent juvenile bears that we like to call the sub-adults are there. Occasionally adult males as well. This is a, a spot where a lot of bears will try to fish. And often successfully when they can't compete for uh, fishing spots at Brooks Falls with um, the higher concentrations of bears there. Or maybe they're just not comfortable you know, being near some of the larger bears that like to fish up at Brooks Falls. So this is a really great one to watch. Uh, we'll, you'll get to see many, many bears in that location. And then we have two more uh, cameras on the river. The main Brooks Falls camera is above the water attached to uh, the viewing platform where people stand uh, to watch bears when they're visiting the river in person. So this is going to give us maybe the best views of leaping salmon, bears catching salmon in their mouths, standing on the lip of the waterfalls, the posturing and the competition that goes on between the individual bears, we get to see them fulfill and hopefully satisfy their hunger, getting uh, as many salmon in their mouths and in their stomachs as possible. And then also at the, at the waterfall too, the Brooks Falls low camera gives us more of a bear's eye view of the waterfall itself. So this is attached to one of the pilings that the wildlife um, viewing platform uh, is built upon. Uh, so it's kind of right at eye level for many of the bears that like to visit 
uh, the waterfall. So that's also a really fun one to watch. Finally, we have one more camera at, at um, in the Brooks River vicinity, and that's Dumpling Mountain. That's high up on the mountainside uh, near Brooks River. It's maybe located about two miles straight line distance from Brooks Falls or so. Uh, so it's more of a landscape view, but occasionally we see wildlife there. Every maybe every you know year or so, we see a few bears on the Dumpling Mountain Cam. We've seen a wolverine up there, but mostly just gives us a great panoramic panoramic view of the landscape. Amazing sunrises and sunsets from up there. Summer and early fall are the, the prime viewing seasons for these cameras. Uh, often the cameras are live until late October and we're fine tuning the camera network and upgrades to the system right now. Later this week, we hope to announce when the cameras will go live. So stay tuned for that. And just a, I just took a, I needed to take a breath there after our, our big uh, summer uh, preview. We have a lot more to talk about during this show. Uh, so let's get to our next segment here uh, because we'll, get, we'll update everyone on our bird camps in just a few minutes. First though, let's focus on an adventure of a different sort. Recently, Explored Org's founder, Charlie Annenberg, traveled to the isolated ocean nation of Palau in the South Pacific. It is a place with some of the healthiest coral reefs and tropical fish populations left on Earth. And Palauans are modeling an alternative approach to conservation and the sustainability of the environment. Let's hear more about uh, Charlie Annenberg's experience at Palau. Thanks for being here, Charlie. How are you? Uh, it's great. Thanks. Thanks, Mike, for having me on our show. <laughs> it's not easy to get on, um, but it's a great, yeah, always like a honor to talk it really did look like an amazing uh, experience that you had uh, at, at Palau. So I haven't been there personally. Maybe one day I'll get there. But uh, can you tell us a little bit more about where it is? Well, it was such a fantasy to go to Palau. I mean, before the live cams, you know, Explore is a documentary film company. And what always attracted me to Palau, it all began with a live cams at the Aquarium of the Pacific. And the tropical reef cam is based on a reef in Palau called the Blue Corner. And I'd always saw it and was mesmerized by this one tank, and that's why we have a live cam. And then one day I was working with some explorer fellows in Hawaii, and I happened to have the chance to sit next to, at the time, the former president of Palau. And he had told me this story about how 80% of their oceans, they were conserving to be a marine sanctuary and a model for the world. And so that just got me so excited. And, and in my original, I always call it fantasy and reality. And in my fantasy, I had this fantasy of going out to plow and wiring this small island nation state with live camp technology and sharing their story of marine conservation live. And then we had COVID and many years later, we finally made it out there. It is one of the hardest places to get to. Um, it's like a 27 hour flight from Los Angeles. There's not many connectors. It's a small country, 22,000 people. But I've been drawn to it because I've been going to the Aquarium of the Pacific since as long as I can remember. And uh, it was an amazing adventure. And I'm excited to share with the Explore audience some of the takeaways. So what, when you were there, uh, what stood out to you that made that experience special or unique? Well, it always starts with the people. Um, this is in a really a diehard group of stewards of the environment. You know, again, you're talking about a population of 22,000. Yeah, we now live in a world with a global population of 8 billion. And most of the ocean pollution and climate change is coming from the industrialized countries, and yet they're the recipient of it. But rather than complaining or this, they really just live by a sense of family, values, indigenous practices, and respect for the sea. So it really begins with them on itself and their stewardship for the environment. I also understand that you had uh, some memorable wildlife moments while you were diving there. Yes, I did. Um, I feel, it's funny talking to you, Mike, but I came across this really unique fish, the Napoleon wrasse. 
So unique is it that I believe it could be what Otis is to the bear population, the Napoleon wrasse could be to the sea. It's over 300 pounds. It swam up to me, I wasn't expecting it, and you look over your head and he's just hovering over you. It has these gigantic teeth and a huge smile. They're endangered, by the way, so they're very unique. And I was joking. I actually said, this fish heals. I felt like it was the Dalai Lama of the sea. I mean, whatever's bothering you, it has an energy. And what made it unique, and I, I saw some of the comments on the YouTube film, is that, oh, you shouldn't touch um, fish. I would never touch a 300-pound fish with teeth the size of a horse to begin with is that he actually is so unique that he likes to be scratched behind his gills because he has some type of parasite. And with the divers that he knows, he permits this. And so uh, no one is actually actively seeking petting the Napoleon wrasse, he actually permits it. I really believe this animal, this animal, this fish is so unique that, like I said, he could do to the ocean and conservation what Otis has done for bear lovers. You also spent some time with a nonprofit in Palau called One Reef. How does their approach to stewardship and sustainability differ from many other conservation oriented organizations that we in the United States might be more familiar, familiar with? Well, you know, I think One Reef is paving the way for a trend that I've seen in other places, which is really incorporating indigenous practices into conservation. These people have been here for hundreds, if not thousands of years, they really have an understanding of the environment and conservation. And so it's really incorporating indigenous practices married with science-based applications. And how do you make economic models where everyone wins? So that's really what One Reef is doing. You know, when we were out there, I was really hoping to get more footage of indigenous practices, fishing, um, the rangers dealing with poaching. Unfortunately, weather didn't really permit. And when you're dealing with um, indigenous elders, there's a lot of um, protocol of trust. And so I don't think they were even comfortable of filming. And so what you see is almost like a reflection of my own experience in Palau. And then we made a short film, which I'm calling the Coral Classroom, which features an indigenous conservationist who's also involved with one reef named Wayne Andrews. And has your experience at Palau shifted any of your perspectives or opinions about how we can protect the world's oceans? You know, these are such great challenges. How do we protect it? But I think it really begins, and it's what we do here at Explore, with just, just falling in love with it. And, you know, once you realize how sacred these seas are and the harmony of living in nature, you develop an emotional connection. I mean, clearly, it's such a tough issue with the warming of the seas and climate change and you know also putting food on your table and economically surviving and how do we live in harmony in nature but what gives you hope is when you see so many people selflessly protecting their seas i mean you always think in america we have to be involved with a nonprofit or this these people are just doing it and i'll give you a great example that napoleon ras outside of these marine sanctuaries these big uh, Asian fishing trawlers come in with bucket loads of cash, bucket loads. And they're basically try to bribe local fishermen to go in and catch fish like the Napoleon wrasse, which would fetch several hundred dollars a pound. And they say no, but that's more money than they'd have in an entire year. And so when you hear these tales of stewardship, you're really touched that the dollar isn't driving the ship, but a sense of principles and values connected to the world we live in. Well, it sounds like uh, you had an amazing journey there, an amazing experience. And um, I want to thank you for taking a few minutes out of your day to hear a little about that, that adventure. Oh, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm thrilled to make it onto this show. And uh, hopefully there'll be more, but it's a, it's a, it's a personal little film, and I hope people, if they have the time and want to learn about Palau and really see some beautiful underwater photography, can tune into it. And to the Explore audience, thank you for being here today and never stop learning. And if you want to learn more, there is that short documentary 
uh, about Charlie's trip to Palau and his thoughts on the experience, as well as that video highlighting the work of One Reef. You can find both of those on our main YouTube channel, which is at Explore Live Nature Camps. Thank you, and have a, have a beautiful day, everyone. It's so cool. I get inspired every time I see Charlie's adventures. And be sure to check out both the Palau video and the Coral Classroom videos on our main channel. And Mike, we did have a few comments that come in before we get to a, a couple questions. Thank you, everybody, for sharing how long you've been viewing. Uh, we have Jack, uh, Jackie W. and Mitchell for their very first year with Explore. You're in for a real treat. Sarah for second year, Moonpath third year. Stephanie H. said they just started watching last Fat Bear Week, which I think we have a lot of new viewers for Fat Bear Week, and we we're excited for another exciting year this year as well. Uh, and Mike, we did have one question that came in. Right, we did, yeah. And um, I'm glad that, yeah, somebody started watching during Fat Bear Week because that's kind of like part of the point of Fat Bear Week is to have get more people paying attention to the Bears of Brooks River and maybe getting excited about the, the next summer. Uh, and we did have somebody ask uh, about um, new bears coming to the river. How many new comer slash unknown bears arrive at Brooks Falls each year? And it's typically a small percentage of the overall gathering of bears at Brooks River. So I don't have a specific number. I never have actually ran the math, uh, but the majority of the newly identified bears at Brooks River each year as part of, and I should put an asterisk next, next to this, as part of the uh, Brooks River Bear Monitoring Study, which is a long-term study of the bear use of the river, the majority of those bears that are assigned numbers um, through that study are sub-adult bears. So they're the independent juvenile bears, maybe been kicked out by mother recently and are finding, uh, trying to make their, their way on their own for the first time. Now, they may not have been experiencing Brooks River for the first time on their own, uh, because maybe mother brought them to the river and they just kind of came back after family separation. However, there's also uh, a few fully grown adult bears that show up at the river every year. We've never seen them before. We don't know where they came from, what they've been doing. Occasionally bears just kind of stumble upon that landscape and they decide to stay. Uh, sometimes they just come in, they look around and they just keep on going because they're not comfortable with the gathering of bears there or maybe the, the numbers of people that are, you know, near the lodge or at the, on the wildlife viewing platforms or something like that. So overall, it's a relatively small percentage. The great majority of the bears that come back to Brooks River every year are uh, individuals that we have seen in previous years. So if you're looking for some of your favorites that maybe you got to know last year or in previous years, there's a very high likelihood that those bears will be back this year. Awesome. And I see more comments coming in seeing your interview with Charlie saying, thank you, Charlie. And another viewer saying, great to hear from Charlie anytime, Palau, wow. <laughs> so thanks again. And we'll be excited to have Charlie back on, on the show. And we are about to run out of time, but you know what? We're going to go over today because we have so much to share. And that brings us to our next regular segment of Egg Watch. Yeah, things have been real busy on uh, our bird cams over the last week. It's just starting with Osprey, where um, we're all on hatch watch for basically all of our Osprey cams. Uh, hatch usually happens 35 to 40 days after incubation begins, and basically all of the remaining eggs that are on the nest are kind of like in that window or very close to it. So starting with the Chesapeake Ospreys, uh, there was uh, there's still two eggs in that nest, but one chick hatched early. Uh, this morning, basic, uh, kind of like very early in the morning or overnight uh, on June 12. Uh, so we're on hatch watch for the remaining two eggs there. So with Audrey and Tom, they are going to be caring for some young young birds very soon. In Montana at the Charlo nest, Charlotte and Charlie, the ospreys there have two eggs. So we're on hatch watch for those uh, two eggs as well over the next few days. In Maine at the Audubon Boathouse Osprey Nest with Skiff and Dory, Three eggs in that nest originally them hatched on June 10, and that one has already been nicknamed Skipper. So we're on egg watch, or excuse me, hatch watch for those uh, remaining two eggs there. And then uh, sticking in Maine 
for the time being, the Puffin Burrow, that chick hatched on June 10, which was much earlier than I had expected. Uh, this uh, chick has been named after Daria uh, Morton, who, as I understand it, was an early Puffin Project supporter. So Willie and Millie are going to be caring for their single chick in that nest. Um, if you're looking at the um, Puffin Burrow above cam view, that uh, look for Willie and Millie to come out of Burrow 15. 59. I had originally thought that maybe we wouldn't see that chick hatching towards uh, until maybe towards the end of June, but uh, apparently that egg was laid much sooner than I knew about. But anyway, animals prove me wrong all the time, which is fun <laughs> because they're smarter than I am <laughs> about their lives. And then the black guillemots um, also on Seal Island in Maine, two eggs in there hatch expected sometime near July 2nd. So we're not quite on hatch watch for that nest yet. We do have a bunch of nests still with chicks in them, uh, starting with the eagles, um, both the Decora uh, eagle nest in Iowa and also the Two Harbors eagles uh, off the coast of California. We're kind of getting into the window right now for fledging in those nests. So still, still just one egg in those nests, or excuse me, one chick in those nests, but they usually start to fledge about 10 to 12 weeks after hatching and they're both really kind of getting right up against that window right now so watch those cameras if you want to have the opportunity maybe to see those eagles uh fledge the nest or uh for the first time and uh in regarding our peregrine falcons the great spirit bluff peregrines um still four uh is in that nest and we're running up against um the fledging window for them as well so they all began hatching about may 8 and um, fledge watch it for them should start very soon, perhaps even as early as the end of the week. So check that out with our Chesapeake uh, Falcon Nest in downtown Baltimore, Maryland. The four ISs there, they've essentially fledged, although they may be returning back to the nest uh, area or that ledge where they were where they were hatched. Uh, over the next um, you know few days or weeks from time to time so um, yeah they they've been practicing and moving and taking their first flight so congrats congratulations to Bo and Barb who are the adult eagles or excuse me the adult falcons on that nest turning our attention now to uh, South Africa in the pair of black eagles there uh, still just one chick in the nest but we've been first we've started to get our first views of the eaglet in that nest before it was just kind of a little too tiny for us to see it was maybe a little bit too far down in the nest cup but we've been seeing some really great views of that eaglet recently they're going to be in this one's going to be in the nest for a long time um, so uh, look for this eaglet to leave the nest sometime in early september finally at our alligator and spoonbill camera in florida um, there's a, co a colony of nesting waiting birds there so not only are there still roseate spoonbills there um, young young birds in their nest also cattle egrets in their nest tricolored herons in their nest but uh, a great egret too so we uh I was, thanks to um people who were taking snapshots of the birds at this location because uh, i wasn't aware there was a great egret nest that we could watch but a snapshot alerted me to that it's been, this one's been interesting um, to see with the sibling rivalry going on and the aggressiveness of that one chick basically poking at the <laughs> head of its parent trying to get more food because the other chick in this um, in this clip got the food first and that hungry one was not at all happy about it. So lots of birds uh, to watch uh, still over um, the next few weeks here on explore.org. Awesome. So much is happening more eggs are hatching more birds are fledging and now and that all comes with the craziest time at explore which is the beginning of summer and speaking of snapshots we do have a weekly photo contest on explore.org called fan cam friday so let's take a moment to see this week's winners <laughs>
Congratulations to this week's winners. If you would like to participate in Fan Cam Friday, all you need to do is take a snapshot by clicking the camera icon above any live cam and then save it to the gallery. Be sure to help us find future winners by favoriting snapshots. And if you are a winner of Fan Cam Friday, <clears throat> you get a special mug or tote bag with your snapshot printed on it. So thank you, Karen Nooney, for sharing your mug shot. And if you would like to share any of your winnings, uh, you can share them to feedback at explore.org or tag explore.org on Instagram or Twitter. And that brings us up to coming up this week. We do have some more live shows. As always, you can catch more to explore Monday mornings at 9 a.m. Pacific. But we also have the AfriCam show tomorrow, Tuesday at 7 a.m. Pacific. If you'd like to go on a, a virtual live safari from the comfort of your home. And then we also have our Wild Moment show on Thursdays, which gives you all the best highlights of the AfriCam cams and hopefully some Bear Cam news later this week. And as far as replays, if you missed it, getting ready for Bear Cam, Mike, you and Charlie were excited and talked about all everything coming up that you're looking for on this season of Bear Cam. So if you missed that, check it out on our main YouTube channel of Explore Live Nature Cams. And Mike, as far as cams that you're looking for this week, what are you, what are you looking forward to? You know, it was, <laughs> we talked about this last week and, and I, I really couldn't decide, but finally I sort of settled on that Gray Fox camera. We had previewed this in other um, More to Explore shows. And I think this is going to be a good one to watch again, especially since this is sort of an ephemeral uh, camera. We're not going to have this Gray Fox family on the cam in perpetuity. So, uh, so yeah, I'm going to be checking this one out from from time to time this week, amongst all the others that we talked about. Definitely, I love the little fox kit. It's so cute. And as far as the cam that I'm watching, of course, we have all of our summer cams, but we also have our Grace Gorilla cams. And we actually just got an internet upgrade at this location, so I'm excited to see much even much more clear views of the gorillas. I start my day every morning watching these gorillas and I absolutely love them. Um, but to see all the best clips and keep up to date with everything at explore.org, you can follow us on all of your favorite social media platforms, including YouTube at explore live nature cams, where you can see both Palau videos. And Mike, as more than just subscribing to social media, how can people get even more involved with explore.org? Yeah, we're always looking for um, help through volunteers. So if you would like to become a camera operator or a moderator for our chats, then uh, go to explore.org slash volunteer, fill out the form. Right now, specifically, we're looking for moderators for the Bear Cam chat during the overnight hours in the USA. So maybe if you like to watch in Europe, or in parts of Asia or Africa where, you know, maybe that corresponds with the evening or daytime for you to matter, depending on where you happen to be. Yeah, we're really looking for those overnight hours. You can follow the link that you see uh, right here. Also the moderators in our chats can help you find that, that link as well. Uh, but thanks to all of our volunteer camera operators and moderators for making the Exploded.org experience such a, a great one. And that brings us to the end of our show today. So thank you everyone for joining us today, all new viewers and returning. And I want to give a special thanks to our moderators, camera operators, and of course, Mike Fitz and our special guest today, Charlie Annenberg. And in honor of Cam Op Cat, we'll end today's show on one of her favorite cams. And we'll see you again next week with more to explore. And until then, have a great week and happy exploring.